Is his day job. <laughs> <laughs> hello, well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, record cafe. Don't worry, I'm not singing. Um, as those of you who may know, probably don't know, uh, we do run a series of pre Bradford City sporting lunchtime lectures. Um, you're very lucky to be here today where we have a special extra sporting lunchtime lecture. This wasn't advertised, this is. Uh, an extra one, uh, we welcome uh, Mr. Glyn Watkins, um, and he'll be doing a, a, a lecture, a talk on how old Bradford used to have fun. So without further ado, Mr. Glyn Watkins. Can you give the microphone stand? Yeah, we've got free, freestyle it. Right, cheers Keith. So I'll hold this far away because I do talk quite loud. So today is St. Blaise's Day. Um, so, which is the reason I'm uh, doing this today and suggested it as a Woody Extra. Now if you know Bradford, you know the Wool Exchange. At the end of the Wool Exchange you've got a clock tower, two statues on it. One of them's Edward III who uh, was a massive encourager of uh, Bradford's, uh, Britain's uh, wool trade, England's wool trade rather, uh, and invited Flemish weavers to come over and teach the English how to do the job properly. Uh, things change, obviously. Um, and there's a statue of him, and there's me dressed as Bishop Blaze underneath the statue. Now, the thing about Blaze, uh, sorry, I do have an apology, I've lost me wool coat. You know, how a man can lose a thing that size, well, I once lost a step ladder. I think I know where I lost it, but if a man can lose a step ladder, he can lose pretty much anything. So, uh, let's go back. So, um, he, was, he had his head chopped off by the Romans, but before he had his head chopped off, he reputedly had his skin scraped off with iron combs. So he became the patron saint of the wool combers and the wool trade. He was um, uh, a bishop in this place, it used to be called Sabas, in, I may be pronouncing that wrong, in Armenia, and uh, the town is now called, I think, Sivas, and Armenia has now been physically moved, uh, you know, several hundred kilometers to the east. As a side note, Armenia is the oldest Christian country in the world, and they're very proud of that fact, and, well, <laughs> The Armenians have been, uh, have been persecuted uh, since they've been Armenians, basically. So, Blaze was uh, a real person, a holy man. He cured a child choking on a fishbone. And it doesn't matter. If you're the only person in the world that knows the Heimlich Maneuver, it's still a, still a miracle. He's also the patron saint of uh, veterinarians, German brass bands, and several other things. He's a Swiss Army knife of saint. And by the way, if you want to be in the premier division of sainthood, you either have to have known uh, Jesus by his first name and had some, uh, and been drinking with him, or you have to be done to death in a particularly grisly manner. Uh, this is a pump clip from um, Salamander Brewery. I used to, and I may still get uh, some plays ale um, uh, made. And if you want to know more about the saint, buy this book. This book is by my brother, uh, Don Basil Watkins. And no, it wasn't the milkman that was his dad. Um, it's a very dry book. Um, if, you, if you know anything about saints, the appendices are quite funny. Um, and, uh, as I said, Bishop Blaise was martyred by the Romans. Uh, and this is the Ermine Street Guard. I was in Bristol last year. Um, at the uh, Blaze Castle in Bristol, uh, celebrating Bristol Archaeology uh, Weekend or Archaeology Week. And uh, if you know, want to know anything about archaeology, you, there's a man down here that uh, knows a bit from Bradford University. Hello, Chris. Um, and I went into the Ermine Street Garden and I said, uh, you martyred me. I didn't say you martyred me because I'm a bishop. Uh, and one of them said, uh, when were you martyred? And I said, 317. And he says, no, that's our great-great-grandfathers um, did that. Uh, uh, sorry, our great-great-grandchildren did that. So, uh, 
world trade. Bradford was the centre of the uh, world, was the trade of, uh, well, the world's centre. Biggest wall city the world will ever know. There'll never be a bigger one because wool is a different uh, commodity now. There was a time when everyone wore wool, now wool is a, a, a luxury item. You have a sheep, you shear the sheep. Um, uh, the wool on the sheep is sorted. There's at least seven different kinds. Most people think of wool, think of spinning wool. My uh, mother's family in Finland actually had sheep, sorted wool and spun it and wove it themselves. But before you can spin it, you've got to process it. Most people that know about processing will have used these things, uh, carding cones. Um, and that's what you do at uh, wool museums. Leeds is industrial museum, have several of these, and they get the kids carding. But before you can card, you've got to comb it out. And that's, that's me with a wool comb. The one on the left-hand side, or your right-hand side, is a proper wool comb. And wool combing was a, uh, a skilled job. Um, it, you'd had a pot of four that were heated, you would comb through the wool that's greased. Uh, the wool, you would be separating long wool, long fibre, which went for worsted, and short wool, which went for woolens. And the men that did this in Bradford and in other parts of the country were a very well-organised union. They paid a sub, uh, they controlled their own work, um, they, um, well, they were in charge of their own lives. And if you want to see that picture I've just shown, Lister Park, uh, uh, Lister Statue in Lister Park, it's one of the dioramas around the bottom. And coincidentally, Lister Park that was created more or less in the 1890s, the building of parks in Bradford was one of the processes of civilising what had become an utterly brutal town. This, these talks are about sporting, uh, sporting themes. But you can have no sport if the people that are playing it or watching it are working 12 to 14 to 16 hour days. And there's a statue down here of Richard Osler who wrote a campaign called the 10 hour bill to stop children under the age of 12 working more than 10 hours. Because it was common for children under the age of 12 to be working more than uh, 12 hours. And the thing about the 10-hour bill is as soon as you stop children working for 10 hours, nobody else could work. Because in the early days, children were absolutely vital to the wool trade. They could get underneath the, uh, um, the uh, spinning frames and tie the threads together. So that's the start of Bradford and the rest of the country getting enough leisure to enjoy leisure. This is Bradford, roughly conjectural map, 1800. Uh, uh, so, 1800, within 20 years, Bradford had doubled in size. Bradford is arguably the town that grew the fastest during the Victorian age. Middlesbrough and Brighton are the other two, but there's arguments about that. So you've got trout in the beck, you've got trees growing up to the edges of Bradford, and very quickly it started getting dirtier um, because the wool, the worsted industry came to Bradford in the first 30 years of the 19th century. Now, the wool combers in Bradford, every seven years, would organise a massive procession on St. Blaise's Day. And this thing here, which you can't read, it's not a very good copy. This is the earliest primary source for anything I tell you. Everything that you know, or I know, about the, uh, the celebration of Bishop Blaise, they never called him St. Blaise. Bradford was a strongly non-conformist town, um, and they always called him Bishop Blaise, and they pretended he invented wool combing, which is just a lie to go out and get drunk, basically. And so this is 1804, and this is held in the archive of York Minster Library. I bet the bloke that collected these came from Bradford and he didn't trust Bradford libraries to be able to keep them properly, so he gave them to York Minster. And this is a procession. The processions that Bradford did were repeated in other wool towns. You had Bishop Blaze on a horse, you had his chaplain, 
you had um, Jason and um, the Golden Fleece, you had the wool combers, you had the charcoal burners, you had the shepherds and shepherdesses. Literally everyone in the wool trade would be in the procession. And the last procession that Bradford had was 1825. So next year is going to be the uh, 200th anniversary. Organised by the wool co, led by uh, a wool merchant, the richest to the poorest were involved. There were around a thousand people in that procession. So, and if you want to know about it, uh, John James, first historian, literally the first historian in Bradford, for, uh, 1841. There was nobody before him collecting, and this is a problem that you keep getting if you're doing Bradford ancient history. There is no history, except there is, sort of. So William Cudsworth is another one. He, is a, uh, he was a physician and a gentleman and so, uh, as I say, when he moved, uh, this town had already doubled in size and he was moaning about, about the fact that soon there wouldn't be a good tree left in Bradford. That um, uh, James, talk, in, in 1841, talks about there being trout in the stream in easy living memory. Um, and that's where, what replaced it. So the Bull's Head Inn was knocked down and replaced in the 1890s, and it's now a subway. Although I don't think it's a subway, I think even the subway have given up. Um, <laughs> it went past, um, get this right, this is Christ Church, which was the second uh, Church of England church built in uh, Bradford. Notice there's a theatre next to it and there's a fair going on, and that's basically at the bottom of this road. If you came up what's now Darley Street, you had to walk around the church. And the church was knocked down in the 1890s because it was a traffic obstruction. There's, there's, a, there's a pattern going on here. Um, you walk past, it actually would have walked past the site of this pub. And at the time, you can't see it, it's not a terribly good uh, image uh, to project. But at the time, this was a little bit of a park or a very uh, nicely organised public garden. And if you walked up, walked through here, walked on, you'd, fall, you'd have fallen into a ruddy deep crop quarry because the corner of John Street Market is built on copy quarry. And it's there quite clearly. You can see this dirty great hole in the ground. So when they build something on John Street Market, I bet the Bradford Council will have forgotten that there's a ruddy great quarry under there. Like they forget where the electric mains are and where the water is. And don't get me started about the interchange and the standing water quietly, and you've got a talk to give. Uh, it's the first mill that survived in Bradford. And the Bradford mills at the time were all spinning because spinning was women's work and it was always a bottleneck. So nobody minded the spinners being put out of work or the women having no work, but the weaving was a different matter. So they had a, they had a row of stocks and 90 gallons of punch and some men got very tipsy. Um, and they finished at the, um, the Swan Hotel, which was a major hotel where a lot of public meetings were held because there was no public pla uh, meeting place in Bradford. And that is, that's, well, uh, 1890s again, got knocked down and replaced by the old Pro uh, Providential building, which is then replaced by the co-op, which is now empty. So, at the end of this, so, uh, February 3rd, 1825, Bradford's pre-industrial high point. It was organised by the workers, but involved all, everybody in the wool trade. There was, there was never a better time before and not a better time afterwards. After that in April, the handloom weavers went on strike. The wool combers joined them. It was 23 weeks. The wool, the wool combers and handloom weavers were utterly broken. It's the first nationally supported strike in British history. Um, but nobody knows about it because it's in Bratford and uh, Karl Marx never came here and he wouldn't be bothered even if he had come here. Um, and uh, it never happened again. There have been sort of revivals of St. Blaise's Day, but I'm the first person to get something going more than one year. And the big thing is tomorrow at the Industrial Museum, if you haven't been for a while, 
also 1825, first nationally supported strike, for last proper blaze celebration, first public health facility because the dispensary uh, and John Simpson act, was actually actively involved in setting up the dispensary, which was where the Churchill pub used to be on Church Bank. And then they moved it around the corner a few years later, and there's still a market, uh, is it Piccadilly or no, Darley Street. There's, a, there's, a, there's a, a green plaque which is fading. First newspaper, again, Simpson was involved with that, lasted three years as the courier. And the first public ex, uh, assembly rooms were started. If you know Piccadilly, there's a very pretty Grecian-style building, which was the per first public place of entertainment, not a theatre. Bradford already had a theatre. Um, and that's what Bradford turned into. This is 1882. 1882 was possibly the high point of Bradford. Bradford had a council that ensured that every new house had a tap and some kind of toilet of its own, which was usually emptied by two blokes with shovels and a hand cart. Um, it had its first parks. It had Manningham FC starting. Um, it, um, it had things being improved all the time. And this is uh, the illustrated uh, London News. Uh, it says in handwriting, it's not, the town is not supposed to be on fire. <laughs> um, but there was a time until very recently where if you came down into Bradford off Leeds Road, but Brad, you couldn't see Bradford because it was like a, a smog. And in fact, uh, Leeds Road, you, if it was foggy on Leeds Road, you could tell which, which way Bradford was, mostly because you'd just go downhill. If you go downhill, you end up in Bradford sooner or later. You, if, but the side closest to Bradford was covered in soot. Now, Walker, like Walker was a gentleman, he did hair coursing. He talked about taking his dogs out to go hair coursing near Heaton. Uh, and it, uh, he talked about hunting, but not directly. He said that he went to see Cleckheaton hounds at Idle Moor, but they were run by a set of blackguards, his phrase. Does anyone know which pub, which brewery this is? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, it's Eldridge Pope. Tetley's, Tetley's hired the same uh, artistic agency to do their, uh, do their pub, their huntsman, as, uh, as Eldridge Pope did, and they came to a gentleman's agreement about it. No, that's the Tetley's one. The Eldridge Pope one is grinning more. The, uh, the, uh, the, the Yorkshire one looks far smugger and tight-lipped. I don't know, I'm sure there's nothing, nothing in that. <laughs> And so, you're working 16 hours a day, what have you got left? Well, what you always had, which is drinking and gambling. Um, Simpson talks about having lost 30 shillings playing whist. Now, 30 shillings, he paid his groom one pound for four weeks' work. So he lost the equivalent of over a week of his groom's wages. And the drinking, just, it's just, what else can you do? Um, but Bradford was always a town, because of the nonconformists, who Simpson absolutely hated, because of the nonconformists, there's always been a thing in Bradford about you're not allowed to have fun. You're allowed to do absolutely nout on a Sunday, not, you know, you can't, open, you can't have plays on a Sunday. First play on a Sunday in Bradford probably wasn't until after the Second World War, so that's how much fun it was. Um, Another thing, so this is, uh, this is an FE2. What do you call the place where a, where a pilot sits? Cockpit. Right, which is named after cockfighting. I've got no direct reference for cockfighting, but there's a very obvious reason why cockfighting might have gone on in Bradford. Can anyone think of it? You're going to be watching, uh, watching them today. No, the Bantons. You don't name your team after a chicken because you like chickens. The thing about Bantons is that they were dirty little buggers, that, uh, dirt, sorry, they were dirty little birds. Very small, but very aggressive and very nasty. And they also, the, the coat tended to remind people of claret and amber, which is why. So there's a direct link in the, with Bradford City to cockfighting. Um, and cockfighting was 
uh, said to be uh, a national sport on QI, and I'll get back to QI, and it was a universal sport. There are still countries where cockfighting is recognised as a legal game because of uh, ancient tradition. Um, so, banned in England 1835, but not until 1895 in Scotland. So obviously the Scots had more, uh, you know, liked, to, liked uh, their cocks to fight more than the English. Uh, and there's still cock fighting going on today. I mean, it just is. Right, very quick question, we're near the end now. When were the first modern Olympic Games revised? This is a pub uh, quiz <coughs> question. 1896. Right then, no. Um, 1612. I looked up cock fighting. Uh, well, no, I looked up the last sport, so this is, this is, and this is, this is, uh, this is a report on shin kicking, this is the Wikipedia report on shin kicking, uh, which was partly inspired by this episode of QI, because Johnny Vegas' uh, uncle was a champion shin kicker. And when I mention shin kicking to anyone, they all say, I thought that was a Northwestern thing. No, Bradford in the 18, mid 18th century, uh, Goitside, which is the area that's ab uh, above um, uh, Lord Clyde, which is by the Goit. The Goit is the oldest thing possibly built in Bradford. It is the uh, channel that took water from, New uh, from the dam that used to be in, uh, towards Girlington to the uh, mill. So the Goit is ancient and you can no longer walk along it and there's nothing to see of it. But Goit side is where the centre of shin kicking. And the thing about shin kicking, you think, well, you just stand there and kick, what? Well, you, you grease your legs with lard. This is how they played it in the Northwest. You, gri you gri grip your opponent by his shoulders. You do not take turns to kick each other's shins. It'll be exactly like boxing. So there's two of you wearing clogs with irons on, and, you're, uh, you're, and when one of them has had enough, is to step back and say, sufficient. Apparently, that's, uh, that's the uh, I give up term in Northwestern shin kicking. But the thing is, shin kicking still goes on, but obviously you, you stuff straw down your socks now and you wear soft felt slippers and you get, uh, you get, you get points for marks. Um, but, you know, as I say, before the 1870s and the half-day holiday, uh, in fact, before 1871, there were only two recognised common law holidays in, a British work, in an English working year. One was um, uh, Christmas Day, uh, Easter didn't count because Easter was always Sunday, as was Whitsuntide. Anyone guess what the third one, what, what the second one was? What day was uh, recognised as a, a public holiday? It was Good Friday. It's a weird thing. Good Friday wasn't recognised in the 1871 uh, Bank Holiday Act, but it was always accepted Good Friday is the day that particularly female servants could go home to their mother, mothers. So. There we go. Uh, rat hunting. The only thing I'm going to tell you about rat hunting is that this book is a brilliant book, Tales of a Rat Hunting Man by Brian Plummer. Uh, and uh, he, he says that he, he, he bought, paid for his house because his dogs were so good at ratting and he bet on the ratting. So um, I was in a pub called the British Queen and a bloke had a terrier, uh, uh, Jack Russell, and he says, do you go ratting? Uh, so we're having a chat about ratting. And he says, I says, oh, I've read a book by, called Tales of Rat. He said, Brian Plummer, his dogs aren't as good as he says they are. <laughs> <laughs> and um, well, that's it. That's my talk. So hopefully see you tomorrow. Uh, Brazy's uh, Wool Festival, that's the big one. That's the thing that, will, uh, that should keep going and uh, bring a little bit of joy to Bradford. And you've been a lovely audience. And if you've got any questions, just shout there. Oh, sorry, 11 o'clock. I didn't. Uh, oh, right. They I send did, me these things that. to proof, but I'm the last Eleven person on God's earth what? to proof anything. <laughs> and I used to, mark, I used to be a teacher as well. <laughs> Tell them to the four. It doesn't say on there. No, it doesn't. <laughs> oh, thank you very much, Clay. Well done, Vin. That's really good. Yeah. Shoe kicking and rattling. Um,
So the next, I just seem to disappear on here to read the next one because I forgot off the top of my head. The poster's here. So the next uh, advertised sports content lecture is Saturday the 16th of March. Uh, so Saturday the 17th of February. He did put it on there, I forgot. And that's Catherine Hay and Steve Bolton on uh, Yorkshire's uh, Hayes Ladies, Yorkshire's Forgotten Football Team. So that's going to be really good. Uh, yeah, thanks again to Glenn. Thank you, everybody. If that's been so, uh, so attentive, that's really nice. Cheers, yeah. Glenn. Yeah. Um, it's been a lovely audience. Yeah. You've all done very well. <laughs> <laughs>